Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, the 13th edition of the BE Economics published by 24-7. And this event is hosted by Baceta, the Council for Retirement Funds. I hope that you've had a beautiful morning and that you are ready to sit with us at 24-7 and across all our different platforms. We want to welcome you and say it is going to be a very, very rich morning. The morning does start off with a beautiful talk by Muteri Wahome. Now, Muteri will provide insights into her recently published book, Building Capital, A History of Asset Management in South Africa. She has written and made this her life's work to bring to us the very first and most beautifully put together chronicle of the asset management industry. She's also tied, assigned 10 copies for us to give away for those who have registered. The first 10 will get the signed copy and it's brought to you by 274 and they'll be in touch directly after this to make sure that you get your copy. I'm looking forward to this, I think for me, with nervous excitement because it's going to be a beautiful morning. We do have the results being announced by Fatima Badwa, MD of 27.4. She'll cover the overall findings of the industry with a specific focus on the public markets. After that, thankfully, Rory Ord has spent, is spending time with us this morning and he will announce the results for the private markets as per the survey. So we have a really a morning for you to sit back, relax, have your cup of coffee and join us as we talk about the industry and how far we have come. Thereafter, we will have a Q&A session, which is going to be most interesting because it will also have some of the people who were involved in the research to answer your questions and to talk about the process followed in order to pull together this particular research findings. And the Q&A session allows you to also ask us a couple of questions and we feel them through to Fatima and Rory. So welcome once again. It's going to be a beautiful morning with us at 24-7, at 27-4, and we really look forward to the following engagements. Muteri Wahome is probably one of the best people to write this book. She's the founder and CEO of the Asset Management Research Institute, a consulting practice focused on providing strategic advice to senior managers, to boards on the sector. As a financial services professional with over 24 years experience, she has a deep interest in financial inclusion and the history, as well as the law of the asset management industry in South Africa, as well as in the global context. I can't say too much because she has prepared a very deliberate and insightful story to tell you about her journey. Once again, thank you for joining us for this 13th edition of the BE Economics published by 27.4 Investment Managers. And this event is brought to you by Batsita, uh, the Council for Retirement Funds. Thank you very much, Zanelle, for that warm introduction. Uh, thank you very much, 27.4 and Batseta Council for Retirement Funds for hosting this very important event. It's an honor and privilege to be here today. Talent is universal, opportunity is not. The history of the institutional investment industry in South Africa began close to two centuries ago when British insurance multinationals first arrived in the Cape. The existence of a well-structured, formalized savings sector, driven initially by the life insurance industry and the emergence of a strong pension fund culture given impetus by the passing of the Pension Funds Act in 1956, had a significant influence on the development of the local economy, capital markets, and professional asset management over the past 60 plus years. However, it is 32 years since the first black key investment professional, the late Shams Pather of then Southern Life was recognized 
in the annals of the industry in 1989. It has only been 23 years since Nkunye Mbezi Heita became the first black woman to head up an asset management firm. Early pathfinders paved the way for investment professionals like Sela Moloko, who in 2003 was appointed the CEO of Old Mutual Asset Managers, then the biggest private sector asset manager, a first for the venerable 158 year old institution at the time. Broad-based Black economic empowerment legislation, sector codes, targets, and scorecards in the past two decades have bolstered skills development, been a catalyst for the participation of Black women across all the pillars of the economy, boosting Black business leadership and reshaping the competitive landscape. Legislation has incentivized the broader industry to improve the level of contribution a company makes to empowerment. The effect of the updated legislation has been an increase in corporate activity as firms sell stakes to black owners to beef up their scorecards. And this no doubt has added some sort of excitement to people who put together these surveys because how will they do that? What's the changes that are going to come through? And that will be interesting to see. But the idea of diversity in our sector is still in its adolescence. And the need to tackle imbalances of opportunity and access remain. Today, 27.4 unveils the 2021 industry report now in its 13th year, that we may examine what is worth noticing, what is worth celebrating, and grapple with the challenges before us. It has only been 14 years since 27.4 was founded, rewriting the narrative of transformation and diversity and inclusion in South Africa. In that time, the firm has supported 45 Black-owned managers, fostering entrepreneurialism, growing investment talent, promoting diversity, creating access to opportunity, and removing barriers that many faced a generation or two ago. 27.4 has provided seed assets to 26 startup firms four of which are women owned, enabling them to start investment track records. This achievement is well worth acknowledging as a bold step into a more equitable future. But is it a moment to pop the champagne yet? The truth is that asset management is not easy and it requires a long-term perspective. Even with strong beginnings, not all of the startups established in the last 14 years have lived up to expectations. Indeed, not every asset management firm will survive the upheaval from the COVID-19 crisis. When asked in a 2011 interview, how long it takes to build a successful asset management business, Henrik Ditoy, the CEO of 91, the biggest private sector firm in South Africa, ranked, 128, ranked 128 in the world in, 19, in 2019. Henrik was unequivocal. It takes 25 years. Five years, to establish an investment track record, five years to draw clients, another five to commercialize the business and take it to fighting weight, and a full decade to make sure that the entity 
does not wither and die. There are no guarantees of success in this business. It's clear. That said, two of the five fastest growing firms in the industry over the past five years to end December 2020 got that crucial head start from 27.4. We could say, to use boxing parlance, the first 12 rounds of this March match are truly underway. And we can only cheer the commitment that 27.4 showed and the resilience these firms have shown. Interesting characteristics about these firms, well, they delivered competitive performance, had a defined style, told their story powerfully, and focused on building professional, well-resourced businesses. Moreover, 10 of the 18 independent firms, that is, those that are not linked to an insurance company or a bank, that are managing assets of 20 billion or more are majority black owned. But five of them graduated from the 27-4 Black Asset Manager Incubator Program. Fighting weight is well on its way to being achieved and we can acknowledge the new players having entered the ring and may in time end up changing the rankings on the champion's podium. That is worth noticing. That is worth celebrating. It is evidence that some black owned firms are beginning to find success in their specialized fields and rising up the ranks, both in terms of investment performance and assets under management. Most crucially, these firms continue to play a vital role in the transformation of the industry, particularly when it comes to hiring, training, and mentoring of young Black investment professionals. Deepening the pool of talent across and within the demographic spectrum is vital for the long-term sustainability of investment firms. The progress of transformation to date, therefore, exemplifies how collaboration between advisors and multi-managers like 27.4, asset owners and unions, as well as government prodding, can transform and contribute uh, to a more inclusive future and sector. And that is why 27.4's efforts Today, shining the spotlight on diversity and inclusion are so valuable. I will now turn my remarks to a little bit about the industry and how we've got here. It's fitting, therefore, that we know our history to understand where we have come from, the sacrifices that were made for us, and what lessons we can learn for the future. That is now where I will turn my focus. In 1994, the imperative to make the economy more inclusive of the disenfranchised black population and the need to transform the asset management industry was clear. Writing about the incredible challenges that lay ahead in their research, professors Nicoli Natras and Jeremy Seekers, Seekings observed, and I quote, when Nelson Mandela and the ANC assumed office in 1994, they inherited an economy beset by problems. Over the previous decade of economic growth, uh, over the previous decade, economic growth had been erratic and weak with GDP per capita growing by an average of only 0.8% per annum. Investment had all but dried up and capital was steadily draining out of the economy." Close quotes. 
High in policymakers' minds was the need for public-private partnerships with government or indirectly through funds managed by the sector to invest in infrastructure to stimulate a struggling economy. Against the backdrop of an autocratic political system and a heavily racialized society, Black trade unions were a significant change maker in the story of transformation and diversity and inclusion. In the 1980s, they blazed the trail for transformation, leading the fight for financial inclusion, championing access to pension funds for all South Africans. As Graham Kerrigan, then CEO of Alexander Forbes pointed out in 1996, in remarks to the Actuarial Society, if the trade union movement had not actively supported worker participation in the retirement funds, the current industry would have been substantially smaller. In 1996, 40 years after the Pension Funds Act was passed, the first dedicated piece of pension fund legislation in the world, workers' rights to have a say in the way their retirement funds were administered was enshrined in pension fund legislation. The new law upheld the, right, the requirement of a 50% board representation for members. Another world first. The act of giving workers a voice in the management of their pensions was, of, was seismic in its import, importance to the transformation of the asset management industry. These gains were not merely remarkable, but historic and paramount to the overall growth and development of the asset management industry. Workers now had a say in how their savings were managed, by whom, and for what purpose. And this contributed to the emergence of a new generation of black founded firms. Blunt conversations with consultants, multi-managers and asset managers demanding diversity led to firms changing the way they hired, developed and promoted black professionals into leadership and investment management positions, thereby increasing their number in the industry. But it was tough for these newcomers. There was a dearth of mentors for young qualified but inexperienced black entrepreneurs and investment professionals and few inclusive informal or formal networks existed that could provide support for the fledgling businesses. The institutionalized racism of the industry with its often elite and closed off networks and its implicit biases were another obstacle to contend with. So these pioneers marketed directly to clients going to the grassroots of the country, building relationships with pension fund trustees who could drive transformation by nudging their advisors to broaden the universe of managers covered and to present inclusive, inclusive shortlists for consideration. Workers also influenced early socially responsible investing um, influencing that debate, significantly demonstrating that stock screening based on ESG principles did not necessarily mean foregoing investment returns. In 1992, Community Growth Fund, the first union controlled investment portfolio was established and it set the stage for others that followed. 
the PIC, the government-owned asset management firm, started its BE development, developmental program in 2009. According to the latest annual report, over 50% of externally managed funds that are allocated to domestic firms are invested with majority black owned firms with 30% black management control. The vocal advocacy of industry organizations such as Batseta Council of Retirement Funds for South Africa, the Transformation Action Forum, the Association of Black Securities and Investment Professionals, ABSIP, and the CFA Society of South Africa continue to generate greater awareness about the need to tackle transformation and the imbalances of ongoing opportunity and access. However, diversity is one thing. Inclusion, that sense of being recognized, being seen or belonging is another. Inclusion has to do with the culture of a firm. Now, a lack of diversity is sometimes linked to a culture of meritocracy. And there are those who hide behind that veil. As Jennifer Henry, the new CFA South Africa president observed in a recent paper on diversity and inclusion, and I quote, she said, we agree that meritocracy enables a high performance culture, but managers should reflect on this from various angles and consider whether meritocracy is concealing conscious or unconscious bias." Close quotes. Too often, diversity has translated into being on the fringes of an organization's heartbeat and looking in as an unacknowledged observer. Inclusion incorporates the intangibles, the often ignored soft issues that have a significant impact on a firm's ability to deliver outstanding results to clients. And like diversity, where we can stand back, see and take stock of things like racial and gender statistics and trends, an inclusive culture is harder to measure, but it is critical to ensuring that a firm is built to last. Just as a tree is recognized by its fruit, an inclusive culture is revealed by words and actions. History shows that firms that are open to ideas that encourage responsible risk-taking, that demonstrate a culture of learning from failure as well as from success, that practice long-term thinking, that are competitive, that are collegial and celebrate achievement, those type of firms attract and retain outstanding individuals giving them the competitive edge. While the longevity of firms is the result of the interplay of many factors, the ability of firms to reinvent themselves through innovative products and solutions that occasionally disrupt but add value to society is critical among them. This is not a new prerequisite for South Africa. Our financial services industry has been leading in innovation and disruption many times in the last hundred years. But if a firm values innovation, it stands to reason that it's a safe place to speak up with ideas. 
We need diversity of thought to come up with solutions that are relevant for all South Africans. If a firm has an inclusive culture, individuals are accepted and allowed to excel on the basis of their skill, insight, and genuine passion for investing without too many distractions. They have a seat at the table where they can just be themselves. If a firm is a fair place to work, you can assume there won't be short-termism that cuts special deals for different members of the investment team. When individuals shape their destiny and have an influence in the organization, they're more productive and are more likely to stay. So in conclusion, executives set the tone and they need to be asking the right questions and not only to themselves. Why is it that so few women are thriving here? Who do we have in the room when we interview new hires? When employment candidates across the table sit across the table, do they see people like them? What are the 20 year consequences of not paying attention to transformation? Ultimately, companies that are more serious about transformation, that include both diversity of gender, of race, of sexual orientation, of disability, that include diversity and inclusion will be the winners. Thank you. Materi, that was a beautiful, um, I suppose, summary of why you did this work. And I think with lots of challenges and thoughts for us, as you look so introspectively into this particular industry of asset management and call out the need for us to continuously be focused on transformation. I'm so honored to be here today because I think at 27.4, I've seen the most committed set of individuals who speak boldly about the transformation and what is required for us to change things, to be reflective of a thriving, a well-balanced society where everybody's given the opportunity to create a legacy for themselves and their families, and everybody gets a chance to participate. And therefore, I think it is so critical now as we move over to looking at the results of the survey. We start off with a conversation that, um, that is led by Fatima Vauda, as well as Rory, looking at the capital markets. I'd like to introduce to you Fatima, who for me is really a ball of energy and fire that is scorching um, the industry, making sure that it puts its mark on the importance of transformation and also walks the talk without excuses. I'd like to, interestingly enough, she comes from Wits University. She spent time there as a mathematical, a mathematician lecturer or lecturer in mathematics. And interestingly, she found her way into the capital markets. She is currently the director of 274 investment managers and has over 20 decades already of experience as a practitioner in the industry with deep knowledge of the South African, the African, as well as the international capital markets. She has a significant experience as well, servicing some of the largest retirement funds in South Africa. And prior to that, she has ensured that she utilizes her deep knowledge in the industry as chairperson of ASISA, the Association of Savings and Investments South Africa. And she's the chairperson of the reporting working committee in the financial sector transformation council and deputy chairperson of the financial services working group of the south african chapter of the BRICS business council a voice to be reckoned with 
really always positive in energy, making sure that she's playing her part in the journey towards transformation. And together with Fatima is Rory Ord, who is acknowledged as an expert in the private equity for institutional investors. And he has advised and trained corporate and public sector retirement fund trustees on the nuances of the private market investments across several countries. Rory, since, 19, since 2017, has also headed up the impact-minded 27-4 Black Business Growth Fund Program, Fund Managers Program, and has really left a mark and made progress in ensuring that these fund managers are able to find their place and their space. After that, we will have a Q&A session that you will find interesting as it brings together some of the survey questions and insights, um, the people that have worked behind the scenes on the survey, and of course, your questions. Fatima, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Zanele. Just a couple of corrections there. Uh, so I'm definitely not the chairperson of uh, ASISA. Uh, that, is, uh, uh, that wonderful uh, position is held by uh, the Investec Managing um, 91 MD uh, Tabo Kudane. Uh, so apologies uh, for that, but thank you so much, Zanele. Um, a very warm welcome uh, to everyone who has joined us this morning. Uh, and, you know, coming in after Muteri, such a, uh, you know, such a big uh, 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 job for me to fulfill and big shoes to fulfill. Uh, the mere scope and magnitude of uh, Muteri's intellectual contribution towards our industry is absolutely remarkable. Uh, so I'd urge everyone to get yourself a copy of Muteri's new book. Um, it's available on Take A Lot, and I'm officially going to be uh, <laughs> being a big spokesperson for, for selling Muteri's book. Uh, but please uh, do get yourself a copy. It, it uh, provides a wonderful history um, of the savings and investment sector and asset management in South Africa. Okay, we're going to move on to the um, results of our survey. So I am going to project uh, my screen now and uh, put up some slides. So hopefully you can see um, uh, the slides. Um, so the way we're going to run this is um, the, I'm going to share with you some of the high level uh, um, data and statistics and the results of the survey. But most importantly, I think uh, what the survey does provide us is an opportunity to identify uh, trends that's shaping the future of asset management and the financial services sector in South Africa. So I will first report on some of the key highlights, but then I will move across to sharing with you um, some of the trends we've identified, and these trends can be incredibly valuable, both from a policy perspective to identify whether current financial sector policy is appropriate to support the growth and development of our economy, uh, as well as identifying whether um, the infrastructure that has been set up in our sector um, is suitable uh, for the future uh, of South Africa, and uh, I think those are key findings um, that uh, policymakers and asset managers uh, can utilize in terms of how uh, we can expect uh, the future to look like. So as indicated earlier, this is our 13th, additional, uh, 13th uh, annual edition. It means that we've collected a lot of data and statistics on the industry. Um, and this really allows us to, um, to be able to uh, uh, identify these, uh, these trends and it's the key ingredient for foresight uh, in planning for the future. Um, I also wanna very clearly state that uh, this publication is put together by highly experienced industry experts and practitioners who understand um, the implementation uh, side, who understand uh, the asset management side, uh, and so it's 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 you know it's not put together uh, by um, uh, by by industry observers, but rather it's really put together by industry practitioners uh, who understand what the key challenges uh, and what really uh, makes this industry tick. Um, over the years, we've kind of evolved the industry, uh, the the survey, and so what you will notice is that. Both Rory and I are presenting today, and uh, therefore we've got quite an in-depth um, uh, um, survey on both the public markets as well as the private markets. We've seen 
significant growth and development in the private markets industry over the past uh, decade or so. And that really comes through in the findings that uh, Rory is going to present a little bit later on. Um, so what is this, uh, you know, uh, you may not be able to see a lot of the graphs and tables very clearly on the screen, uh, but this is some of the high level findings which you will find um, in the actual survey. Uh, so the growth in the number of uh, black owned firms, and we have very specific criteria that determine the participation in the survey. So you've got to be more than 51% black owned. Um, your board of directors have got to be majority black and your senior investment professionals within the investment team have got to be majority black. Um, and that number has grown uh, over the years and currently stands at 55 uh, firms who meet that criteria for participation. I think the most notable entrant to this year's survey is Sunlum Investments. And this is the Sunlum asset management business, excluding the multi-management business, but including um, the passive franchise in the form of Satrix, uh, as well as the alternative investments component. So collectively, uh, they bring on board uh, around 345 billion rands uh, to the survey. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, this is a huge uh, a, a milestone uh, for the survey, because what it basically means is that um, transformation policy is working and uh, the trend and the shifts and the tailwinds of triple B policy are being recognized and acknowledged by industry, uh, um, uh, by, by incumbents in the industry um, that in order to uh, achieve good commercial success and good outcomes, there has to be that willingness to accelerate um, uh, uh, transformation imperatives. And asset owners have, have played a big role uh, in ensuring uh, this form of equal opportunity and drive uh, that is representative of the company uh, of the country's demography. And so, to remain competitive and relevant, uh, you know, companies have to move, move beyond aspirational commitments and actually walk the talk. Uh, and so, we are very pleased uh, that Sanlam have recognised um, that transformation is good for business. Um, and have been added uh, as a participant meeting all the criteria for participation this year. And through the 344 billion rands, as well as um, uh, uh, significant growth we've seen uh, towards um, a deployment of capital towards black owned asset management firms, as well as very strong capital market performance. Um, we've seen the total AUM managed by this cohort of asset management firms um, surge to uh, close to 1.2 trillion rands, now sitting at 1.1 trillion rands. Uh, having said that, uh, what you can see from the pictures to the right-hand side is that it is concentrated in the hands of a few managers, and we've got a long tail of very um, uh, small uh, uh, participants. Uh, so the three largest asset management firms in the survey now one over 300 billion rand is Sanlam Investments. Between 100 and 300 billion rands is two asset managers, and that is Prescient Investment Management and Quanta Asset Managers. And in the 50 to 100 billion category, one of the most uh, successful firms we've seen that has experienced exceptional growth over the past three years has been the likes of Bunani Fund Managers and Alwani Capital. Um, so if we look at the top five asset managers, uh, from the ones that I've mentioned, um, they manage around 73% of AUM with the top three, uh, uh, Sanlam, Tequanta, and Prescient managing 59% uh, of overall AUM. Um, the big shakers and movers this year, as I said earlier, were the likes of Bunani Fund managers and also um, Aeon Investment Management who experienced a uh, very good growth and broke through uh, that 15 billion rand mark. Uh, and what you can see from the box at the bottom that's been highlighted in, um, in bold is that asset managers really struggle to break through that 15 billion rand barrier um, with very few uh, 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 really uh, 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 breaking that barrier. And Aon has been one of those firms um, that broke through that barrier. Uh, quite a large chunk of managers playing between the one and five billion rand, 
uh, as well as between the five and 15 billion rands. Um, the industry supports a total of 1,157 jobs, uh, bearing in mind that the asset management industry is not a large employer of people. It's generally the supporting uh, services that uh, are the large employer of people. And for example, fund administration businesses employ a lot more people um, than the asset management industry. Also of the 1,157 uh, people employed, uh, around 400 people um, uh, is uh, comprised of uh, Sanlam employees. Okay, moving on to other highlights. So uh, one of the areas that we repeatedly get uh, quoted on in the market, uh, which makes me very nervous sometimes, but is um, what share of the total market is managed by Black-owned firms. And we've been very careful in the calculation of this figure, as well as how we um, calculate the denominator as we've received, uh, in, uh, you know, we've received a lot of input and comments from industry participants. So we've tried to do our best this year to get an accurate reflection of the size of the uh, capital that is available for um, black owned asset management firms. And so if we calculate the total size of the regulated savings stocks, excluding banks, short term insurance, and medical schemes in South Africa, we get to around 8.4, 8.5 trillion rands, uh, bearing in mind that there is, um, uh, 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 this is an estimated figure because the figures that are published by the various institutions occur at different time periods. So if we're looking at around 8.5 trillion rands, um, and if we remove uh, the portion of assets that is managed internally by the very large uh, retirement funds and asset management firms, so the Public Investment Corporation, ASCOM Pension and Provident Fund, Metal Industries, Benefit Funds Administrators. Um, those uh, institutions manage quite a significant stock of capital internally. So if we uh, estimate what that value is, and in our estimates, we value that uh, portion to be in the range of 1.8 uh, trillion rands, uh, that is managed managed internally, and if we then calculate the portion of uh, assets managed by black-owned firms, um, including and excluding uh, internally managed institutional assets, you get to fourteen percent on the basis of including the institutional managed assets, and uh, twenty percent if you exclude the institutional managed assets. Um, and we do believe that this is an accurate reflection of. Uh, black owned market share. Uh, what you can see, I've also broken it up into five, uh, the top five and then the balance, the tail of asset managers. So including, into, uh, so if you look at the top um, five, the top five essentially manage uh, 10 and 15% of that capital. And then the balance of the 50 asset managers will make up the long tail uh, managers on average around 5%. Uh, so the topography of the sector is increasingly becoming uh, fairly lopsided with uh, concentration uh, on, on the one end um, and, and the long tail on the other end. Uh, CIS statistics, uh, based on current figures, we estimate uh, Black-owned market share of that to be in the region of 13.5%, uh, but that includes um, the addition of Sanlam Investments this year which has got quite a number of uh, unit trusts in the market. Uh, and then Rory will speak about black uh, market share of the private markets, but currently we estimate that to be in the region of 18%. Um, what is very interesting, and when we talk about financial sector infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure of the financial sector is really uh, what uh, allows uh, businesses to thrive because it enables businesses to grow. Uh, and what you see in the a quote at the bottom is that if you look at the collective investment scheme space, um, the largest mancos in the country uh, consistently have remained the same over the years. So Alan Gray is the largest manco, followed by 91, followed by Stanlib, um, Coronation and Net Group. Uh, and um, the black participants in that group uh, this year with the inclusion of Sanlam falls into number seven. And then, of course, Prescient comes in at number 10, uh, who is um, uh, more of a co-naming partner, as well as Sanlam. Uh, they provi provide co-naming arrangements with external asset managers. So very little movement in um, the, 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 the Manco side 
uh, and there is an opportunity for disruption in that space uh, from a transformation uh, perspective. Um, if we then move on to um, the highlights to um, the mandates and, and where we see the largest flows of capital, uh, most interesting is that uh, picture on the top right hand side, which shows you the allocation to the top six asset classes. And what you can see is that in 2010, um, close to 60% of overall assets managed by black owned firms was in the domestic equity space that is nicely diversified now. The proportion of domestic equity exposure is now a uh, shy of 30%, and we've seen um, uh, the inclusion of uh, um, other asset classes and skills and talent and track records in other asset classes, even the inclusion of offshore uh, um, exposure and uh, talent with 15 asset managers now offering uh, products in the offshore space and the assets and the management of the overall um, cohort growing to 5% uh, of the total, which is the top maroon uh, shaded area graph. Uh, but the bulk of the assets over the past couple of years has largely been in the uh, bond space and in the money market space, uh, with money market only having reduced over the past year um, as a result of the drastic cuts in the repo rate by the South African Reserve Bank, which precipitated a rotation out of money market funds and into fixed income and equities, uh, which is very evident in that graph on the right hand side. Uh, what we can comfortably tell the market and the industry is that there is no shortage of black talent across asset classes. Um, and the, uh, you know, ranging from um, offshore to uh, passive to active, um, there is um, a wide uh, range of talent in the market. Uh, and also an important factor to note is that um, the number of strategies that asset managers uh, manage currently sits in the region of around three with a, a few firms having a, a very diversified product offering. Um, having a very diversified product offering versus having a niche product offering is largely dependent on the uh, strategic model of the firm. Um, and increasingly, as has been evidenced by global trends, um, asset managers are moving in towards either niche-based models or large distribute, uh, distribution-based models. And we'll talk about those models uh, later on. And I think the point we want to make here is that achieving success is really not a function of the number of products on offer, but the ability to identify the business model that speaks to um, the strength of the investment management team and the ability to leverage such a vision and grow scale. Um, and we will also share with you the disruption of technology and outsourcing and how that has allowed uh, smaller firms to bend the laws of scale. Um, as I indicated earlier, uh, Vunani Fund Managers has been a star performer of the past two years in growing assets under management. Last year, they grew AUM by 35%, and this year they've grown AUM by 30%. Uh, so out of the top 10 firms, um, they grew um, AUM um, the most. Okay, uh, just on the point of um, offshore uh, offerings, I think one of the challenges that we face at the moment is that uh, we have a lack of diversity in the investment strategies that are being offered by uh, Black-owned firms. Uh, most firms can either be classified as, as value or quality managers. Uh, we're seeing um, no growth or further diversification in other styles. Um, and this really creates challenges for asset allocators requiring exposure to uh, different styles and they are forced to look elsewhere. Uh, so hence, um, you know, asset managers seeking to play in that space will need to be a lot more creative to lure asset allocators' interests uh, and win mandates in this um, highly uh, competitive space that is uh, dominated by international players with very strong uh, resourced uh, houses. So just something to look out for in that space. When we look at um, the last of my slides uh, in terms of highlights, and trust me, there's a lot more highlights and you'll have to pick up the the, the soft copy online, which has been released this morning to, to, to get all the detail. We're only touching the surface here with some of our highlights. 
Um, what I'm sharing here uh, uh, on this slide is sustainability, and Muteri spoke about attrition earlier as well. You know, not all firms make it. Um, and over the years, we've seen firms join the survey and subsequently leave the survey, either because they've not been successful at building AUM, um, not been profitable, have struggled with, build, with, with, uh, with capital, particularly in the early stages of the business. Um, and this also speaks to the bulk of the corporate activity we've seen over the past couple of years. And I'll speak to that a little bit later. But currently, we have 73% um, of firms have indicated that they are profitable. Uh, of those firms stating profitability, 54% have delivered three consecutive years of net profit after tax, and that's really increased over the years. Uh, but what was most interesting was the 89% who have indicated that they are extremely confident of their forward-looking revenue projections. Um, and uh, given the unprecedented uncertainty, um, uh, you know, it really demonstrates agility by some of these firms uh, and the growth opportunities that have been presented because that confidence is, is uh, something to be spoken about. 27% of firms, um, a break even AUM is less than a billion rands, and, and that's a modest number. Uh, so you've got to ask yourself the question that. Uh, why is that number so modest? And it may mean that a new entrance to the industry are, um, are, 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 are looking for mandates that probably uh, are pay a, 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 a lot higher fees, bearing in mind that um, you know, uh, the break-even point for, for example, active equity versus uh, fixed income on the passive side is going to be much different. Um, so the pandemic is also... Uh, accelerated the use of and the adoption of digital uh, technologies, working from home, et cetera. So bricks and mortar costs, uh, fixed cost leverage uh, has declined, um, uh, possibly making the break even point for um, AUM uh, a lot lower than was previously the case. Um, and then on the stockbroking side, uh, you know, we've seen similar movement and trends and shifts as we've seen um, in the asset management front, uh, you know, they have their own challenges with regards to um, transformation, et cetera. But currently, 76% of this group of respondents uh, procure up to 60% of their brokerage spend uh, from Black-owned firms. Um, and I recently uh, did some work around this, and, and what we have identified is that um, a lot of buy-side firms uh, you know, their needs are varying depending on their size. So large asset managers prefer stockbrokers that can offer them algorithmic trading, high and low tax services, block liquidity, risk capital, uh, and, and smaller fund managers look for res uh, research. So similar to the asset management industry, um, you know, models on the stockbroking side uh, require reposition to deal with these future trends and shifts that we're seeing. Um, so... Those were some of the high level findings. And again, please refer to the actual publication for all of the findings. But what I want to move over now, because as I've said earlier, this survey is not just about measuring the pace of transformation. This survey over the years has provided so much data that allows us to uh, forecast trends in the market and allows uh, uh, market participants that, to position their businesses, to capture some of these trends and transition their strategic business models so that they can be well positioned for the future. Um, so one of um, the, the biggest trends that we can very clearly identify is that uh, the, the laws of the traditional benefits of scale have been changed. So what do I mean by the laws of the traditional benefits of scale? So the traditional benefits of scale have always been that the biggest players with the biggest buildings and the most amount of people, fixed cost leverage, investment, um, investment capacity, distribution heft will continue to, you know, uh, uh, only uh, uh, support those businesses that have those qualities. Uh, but what we've seen now is you, with the increasing ease of outsourcing, large parts of the activity chain, um, technology enabled, smaller players will be able to thrive 
uh, in this type of an environment. Uh, and if smaller asset managers can put together the best of breed components and create very strong, efficient operating models, they can reduce lower, they can reduce their operating costs and create lots of flexibility and ability, uh, freeing up resources um, and allowing them to build innovation and differentiate their core capital, uh, their, their core capabilities. And they will be able to bend uh, the rules of scale. And in our survey, we asked a couple of questions. So first of all, what we've really um, picked up that is uh, a lot of firms have moved to hybrid working models. In fact, some firms have given up office space altogether. That was very, very interesting. Um, and um, uh, dining rooms have become conference rooms uh, with, with, uh, uh, with many firms indicating that uh, they've provided complete flexibility to their staff and, and they can work from home even when we've totally recovered from, from the pandemic. A lot of firms have reduced their office space. So the hybrid working model, in my opinion, is definitely here to stay. We've seen a massive move towards digital uh, transformation. The customer experience wants to be the same. Uh, people spend so much their, of their time on uh, cell phones, mobile technology, and they want the same experience they get on Amazon or take a lot from their, all of their service providers. Uh, and so the digital transformation revolution has accelerated as a result of the pandemic. Um, and you can see from the graph to the right hand side, uh, businesses are making uh, uh, the digital transformation journey a priority and asset management firms in particular are using it in all different types of manners. One, they're using it on the artificial intelligence side to grow their customer base, to understand their customer base, to use AI technology in terms of how they manage their portfolios, um, but also uh, to look at ways of, of uh, ultimately uh, a growing distribution. So it ranges from portfolio management activities uh, to harnessing technology in, um, uh, in, in the uh, in the distribution and, and how they contract with, with, uh, with their customer base. So very, very interesting trends. Uh, however, we've also picked up that in South Africa, contrary to the findings we've read uh, globally is um, South Africans actually uh, reported that uh, the disruption caused by the pandemic has not um, impacted their uh, uh, productivity in a negative way with only 17% indicating um, that uh, uh, their employees' mental health has been negatively impacted uh, by the pandemic. So um, that's quite positive uh, from, from that perspective, where a lot of firms have in fact reported um, that they've seen uh, 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 remote working uh, improve um, overall productivity and uh, idea generation, as you can see from, from the graph to the left hand side. This is one of the big trends, hybrid working models, digital transformation, outsourcing, focusing on the core business. Um, and this genuinely uh, is a, a, a tools that can be used um, to compete against large uh, uh, firms and established firms who um, you know, take a long time to change and to uh, modernize and to move with the times. And you know, just an example of that would be, uh, for example, the recent acquisition of Standard Bank by Lib uh, of Liberty. Uh, and potentially one of the challenges is that some of these just become too old to move uh, and to change infrastructure. They lose their flexibility, they lose their, their agility. Um, and requires uh, 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 change to come through. Um, the Muteri spoke extensively about diversity and equity and inclusion. And, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just about uh, a race and gender. It's about a lot more. Uh, it's about where did you grow up? Did you go to the same school? Uh, people like, you know, it's about all the cognitive biases that exist uh, um, behavioral uh, uh, scientist uh, Daniel Kahneman has spoken about this extensively, um, uh, how people make decisions based on where they come from, uh, who they know, uh, the biases that exist in our industry from 
uh, you know, if everyone's in the same, came from the same school, we all support each other and we will uh, confirm each other and leading to confirmation biases. So uh, these type of things really have a significant impact on the way investment teams function. Um, and uh, I think it's an, it, 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 the DEI risk in investment management teams is, it does exist in our market um, and it should be considered as a risk. Uh, you know, we definitely need new mindsets and, and it needs to be driven uh, by uh, um, the executives of the business. Um, and, you know, interesting, I was doing a presentation to one of my clients last week and uh, um, one of the, uh, my clients said to me, you know, how he thinks about a DEI, he said, you know, you get invited to the party, but nobody asks you to dance or you're not allowed to dance. And I cannot tell you how well that resonated with me, because over the years I've been invited to so many parties, but when you want to dance, you're not allowed to dance. And um, I think it's a serious reality that we face in our industry. And the statistics don't lie. We've got to put it out there. Uh, only five CEOs of the top 100 companies listed on the JSE by market capitalization are women. Only five of the top 100, and of which two are black. If we look at the amount of CEOs, we can, I mean, CFOs, uh, 82 percent of CFOs uh, are male CFOs. Uh, I mean, this is not a nice picture on the right-hand side. Furthermore, uh, what we have found from our cohort of respondents in, in the survey, uh, our findings show that the two most important positions in the firm, that of CEO and head of the investment team or CRO, are held by men in majority of firms. Interestingly, whilst black men dominate the position of CEO when it comes to leading the investment team, in fact, there are more white male portfolio managers in black owned firms than black male portfolio managers. And now there's an interesting statistic. So, um, in fact, you will see in our survey currently. Um, if we look at the demographics of the portfolio management teams within the public market space, and this picture is very different in the private market space, which Rory will talk about, because I think private markets really reflect the uh, demography of South Africa much better uh, than the public market space. So the demographics of portfolio managers within Black-owned firms, 42 um, are Black male and 48 are white male. Uh, so Black owned firms have more uh, 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 white male uh, portfolio managers and, and very few um, black female uh, uh, portfolio managers, whereas they have an equal number of black female analysts. And um, the problem is what's clearly been identified is that um, there is no pathway for women analysts to transition to portfolio management role. So there isn't a clear career pathway. And I think it should be a strategic imperative of this uh, industry to create, because what we're finding is that an equal number of women and male analysts join at the same time in firms, but only men transition from analyst to portfolio manager. So um, that, that is something that we can definitely um, look at in the industry if we want to reduce the 200 year trajectory that's been estimated to achieve uh, a gender parity um, in asset management uh, uh, globally. Okay, moving on to the next big trend that we've identified and that will continue to, to, to grow with relevance and importance is that of ESG. Now, COVID-19 has definitely exposed and exacerbated systemic social issues, poverty, inequality, um, and uh, recently over this past year, um, we've seen uh, a massive climate change events uh, that has impacted uh, parts of, of um, all parts of the world. But what we saw recently was, was the hurricane in the US, we saw the flooding in parts of Germany, et cetera. Um, and Africa is, is identified as one of the continents that's most vulnerable to climate change and is also expected 
um, to have uh, implications and, and uh, a downward impact on a range of issues ranging from food security to urbanization to health. Uh, so these issues, um, the green recovery, the just transition, dealing with these issues and uh, from a from an uh, uh, ESG integration perspective, an awareness perspective, an implementation perspective is critically important. Um, and Rory will speak about uh, some of the impact that asset owners are now looking for uh, in terms of the investments they are making. They want to see that uh, the investments that they are making are having a positive impact on biodiversity issues, um, are having a positive impact on uh, animal welfare, uh, slavery, you know, like all of these things that human rights, um, we, we need to make sure that we are creating the economic growth, reducing inequality, uh, creating jobs and, and, and having an impact on prosperity uh, for our people. So the focus going forward is definitely going to be on good impact outcomes, uh, focus on climate change, and, and we're very proud of the participants in our survey and this cohort of, of, of asset managers who are very active and beginning to become, uh, you know, really make a dent with listed companies in particular. I mean, it was announced yesterday that one of the asset managers um, joined um, Just Share in tabling a climate change resolution at Sassel's AGM. Fantastic. We need more asset management firms doing that. Uh, when it comes to ESG standards, um, you know, we do have a challenge with asset management firms, um, you know, greenwashing to a large extent. Uh, you know, we've seen, uh, yes, we subscribe to this policy. Yes, we are signatory to uh, uh, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. Yes, we subscribe to CRISA. But does that mean anything, you know? Uh, so we've got to have, um, uh, while, you know, you display the level of positive responsible investment behaviors, uh, you know, publicly making your votes, your records uh, available, making your policies publicly available um, is, is definitely um, areas for, for, for improvement by the industry. But also it seems as though South African asset managers are only focusing on the G and they're not focusing on the E and the S part. So there's an urgent need to address issues um, such as uh, inequality, climate change, and it requires a lot more focus uh, on achieving uh, real-world uh, results. Uh, also, ESG integration is not the same across all asset classes, so um, very strong in the listed space, uh, but more on the equity side and not so much on um, uh, credit and, and, and sovereign debt and, and the bond market. So we hope to see an improvement on that side. But this is a trend that's going to continue to grow in relevance and uh, importance. Uh, and um, we want to see a lot less greenwashing and a lot more uh, participation and impact and uh, collaboration uh, as an industry so that we can achieve better um, outcomes on all the E, the E, the, the S, um, and the G component. Okay, controversial. Let's get to the controversy part of, of um, the, the, the survey is uh, codes and triple BE legislation. Now, the reason why I've put up the graph on the left-hand side, very, very interesting trend that we've identified uh, over the years um, through our data. In 2011, 64% of participants in the survey were more than 90% black owned. Now only 32% of survey participants are more than 90% black owned. In 2011, less than 9% had between 50 and 60% black ownership. Now that has grown to 34%. So what the graph on the left-hand side is indicating is that there's been a significant amount of corporate activity within the asset management industry when it comes to black ownership. So one, there's been notable um, triple BE transactions in the market and the two conspicuous ones with respect to our survey has been that of prescient investment management two years ago or three years ago and the Sunlam investments transactions which saw black ownership increase beyond 15%. I mean, 
The other area has been that of consolidation, a decreasing uh, capital base, a highly competitive industry, um, fee compression, capital requirements, uh, cost of human capital. Uh, and this year we saw uh, some form of consolidation up and coming asset management firm was close to 10 billion rands of AUM uh, and Gwedi investment managers got taken out by Tequanta asset management. Um, we've seen exiting shareholders within some firms and we've seen some firms uh, needing access to capital resources, new markets and distribution and the likes of RMI investment managers, African Rainbow Capital, um, have come to the market uh, with those type of, of uh, uh, transactions uh, to facilitate um, and, and provide access to capital and, and distribution. Um, and uh, that has been, uh, you know, the trend that we've identified in the market corporate activity and uh, given um, the tailwinds of triple BE from a policy and an asset owner perspective, we will continue to see uh, more movement in that space. Um, I want to emphasize that um, the industry over the years has also become used to focusing on input spend and not on outputs. Um, and uh, if we look at the financial sector code and the various elements of the code, um, the Triple B Commissioner has been very vocal about this. And what we are finding in our research and analysis is that the, 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 the problem, the big problem in the industry is management control. Uh, you know, you get your ownership target, but you, uh, the ownership targets do not manage, ma match up with management control. Um, and that's where the industry, the entire financial sector, in fact, falls short on is management control. Ownership is fine. And then the focus on input spend and not on good outcomes. Um, you know, there's this real disjuncture because we are, you know, we are spending the amount of money to get our points on a procurement and ESD and socioeconomic development and, and those type of things and various uh, advisors within the industry and bodies have put together solutions. So, you know, let me just contribute this money and take this headache away from me and it will go away and I don't need to care about outputs. Let these guys deal with it. And the unfortunate thing with that is we're not seeing um, any change in the industry because there's been no measurement of whether uh, there's been success uh, on the output that has been achieved from the allocations towards uh, socioeconomic development and uh, ESD. Uh, and I think we've got to move towards an industry that um, participates in those activities, but uh, looks towards uh, achieving good social outcomes and not tick the boxes uh, to, to, to focus on inputs. And, you know, it speaks to uh, broader issues in South Africa. You know, the amount of money we spend as part of our fiscus and contributing towards um, education and healthcare. And sometimes we just feel like we're not getting a bank for our buck. Uh, and similarly, when it comes to BE scorecards, let's move away from focusing on input spend and let's focus on outcomes. And let's try and do away with some of these components um, that really shed um, a bad light on, uh, uh, on the industry. Um, la, uh, I think I'm really close to being done, but, um, and, and thankfully you, uh, we, we, we're still running ahead of time. So um, I should finish uh, shortly. Um, the next big trend that we are seeing with outsourcing comes a lot of risk. And cyber risk is and data privacy are two of the biggest risks facing financial institutions. And what we have found is that organizations are definitely not prepared and have inadequate protection. Um, the increase in remote working arrangements, digital transformation, um, it's a huge business imperative for asset managers to build the resiliency that is required to protect their businesses from. Uh, potential operational breaches and disruptions in the space. Uh, it's an everyday reality. Uh, it shouldn't be a once of tail risk. Um, and what we have found is that only 30% of our cohort of managers have got some form of protection against um, cybersecurity, uh, with the bulk of participants believing that it's not their problem, but it's the problem of the outsource uh, providers, and it's the problem of the administrator. 
So um, I hope that uh, we all make sure that the administrators that we outsource our administration to have got the right amount of cyber risk cover to protect uh, your firm. Uh, but we also believe that increasingly the focus from uh, the regulator will be on outsource risk and uh, we should uh, uh, ensure that we tighten up our belts and, and tighten up our, um, I mean, basically tighten up our operations to ensure that we're not exposed and we're not putting our clients and our customers uh, at risk as a result of um, this potential uh, 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 risk that exists in uh, this new way of doing business, this new generation, uh, et cetera. So this is also a big trend that we've identified. And then I love the slide and, and the focus on the top four um, components. And this is, if, if, if I'm an asset management firm, I would want to say, sit back at my board strategy meeting and say, where do I fit in with regards to those top four um, uh, components that have been listed on the top? Am I a specialized alpha shop? Am I a beta factory? Am I a solutions provider? Or am I a distribution powerhouse? And depending on where you believe is your biggest strength and where you can leverage your most amount of capacity and resources, um, we think that globally, uh, you know, the Boston Consulting Group has done a lot of work in this space. Um, and if you want to be positioned for future success, not be left behind uh, by disruption. Um, I mean, we've seen businesses, I mean, businesses that we have incubated 14 years ago um, that, that grew successfully. And then, uh, you know, you go through this period of, uh, maybe you lose focus, maybe something happens, but then you need to reinvent yourself. And that cycle with any business is normal. You know, nobody wants to become a Kodak in our market. Um, so that process of reinvention, uh, reorientating your, your business uh, is something that needs to happen all the time. The discomfort you've got to face with, with reinvention should exist. Um, and uh, it would help businesses to strategically position themselves appropriately so they can capture the potential opportunities and the trends uh, that are moving forward. Um, so regardless of size, um, and I think, you know what, uh, from an emerging uh, manager perspective, the, your opportunity exists now, because as I said earlier, um, the, 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 the digital uh, revolution has uh, uh, allowed you to bend those laws of scale of fixed cost leverages and uh, fixed cost leverage, and, and you can distribute your products to a wider spectrum without uh, spending uh, uh, what one would have spent uh, uh, many years ago. So those opportunities do exist in the market and it's there for the taking. Um, and um, as I said earlier, um, really enjoy that, that, that uh, slide. So I've got two um, uh, slides left. Uh, so we asked asset management firms, uh, where do you see the biggest trends going forward? Uh, they believe that the biggest focus is gonna be on investing for impact, uh, focusing on ESG. Uh, we'll see some form of industry consolidation in the market, um, real assets, including private markets. Uh, that's where we're gonna see a lot of growth. Interestingly, um, you know, people were very undecided and unsure about the growth of, of crypto uh, currencies and, and uh, uh, crypto uh, uh, Bitcoin type of investments. Uh, they, there wasn't too much uh, kind of support for that. They don't see it uh, picking up too much. So that's a space we're going to watch. Uh, they do believe that uh, focus on decompression is going to continue, uh, transformation is going to continue, uh, and the continued focus and investment into passive investments um, will continue, as has been the trend uh, internationally. So real assets, passive, crypto, uh, watch those trends. Let's see where they um, go to. Um, you know, we all need to worry about uh, where we... Um, what keeps us awake at night. Uh, and um, what does keep us awake at night is uh, these sort of risk factors. And asset managers have identified that what really 
uh, keeps them awake at night is South Africa's macroeconomic framework, our sluggish economic trajectory, uh, our stretched balance sheet, political risks, policy disconnect, uh, most respondents rated these factors as, as medium to high risk. They've also expressed similar concerns in previous surveys. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, these have been cropping up uh, for a long time. Um, they also see growth and stagnation in the savings pool as a major risk. South Africa as low savings rate falls below uh, many of our middle income peers. Um, and uh, at the time of writing, government was, was, was pushing, uh, you know, the regulatory change to allow South Africans to access their retirement funds early, which will potentially even compound an, an already weak position. Uh, and then, of course, the continued push uh, towards uh, umbrella funds is a key risk because the benefits of umbrella, commercial umbrella funds relative to standalone umbrella funds is diluted over the years. Um, uh, participants uh, are also worried about the, 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 the amount of delistings we've seen on the JSC. In fact, I was having a chat with Materi before she kicked starting. You know, she's done this fantastic research about the, 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 the start of the JSC. And she said to me, you know, in 1890, we had 300 companies listed on the JSC. Guess what? In 2021, we still have 300 companies listed on the JSC. We've fallen from our peak of 780 or whatever it was. Uh, so, so that is a continuous worry, the concentration risk, and we've spoken about this at length before. Um, we think that the changes to Regulation 28 and asset managers do not see this as a big risk, that the potential for pension funds to increase in, in, in infrastructure projects um, is exciting. We believe that there will be multiple mediums uh, for investment in infrastructure, and it won't just be uh, an opportunity for unlisted uh, participants, because there could potentially be um, uh, instruments that list on uh, the public market space, uh, which could uh, uh, allow the entire market to benefit uh, from the rollout of um, the infrastructure fund. Uh, and we have a fantastic interview with the head of infrastructure and treasury at the, the Development Bank of South Africa, uh, an interview with him uh, in the survey, and he provides such a, a, a wonderful background in terms of the project and provides clarity in terms of the participation. And we're so excited by the fact that, um, you know, there's a real opportunity to grow South Africa's economy and take everyone with it uh, in this journey of uh, uh, migrating towards uh, uh, developing um, our, uh, uh, you know, using infrastructure as a catalyst to grow our economy. Uh, so on that note, uh, I'm going to leave you and hand you over to my uh, esteemed colleague, Rory Ord, who's going to share with you um, uh, his uh, findings on the private market space. I've stolen a lot of Rory's time. Uh, having said that, I still think we're looking good with regards to time, and I will join you back uh, with Zanele when we get to um, take some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and good morning to everyone. Um, uh, to, to pick up where, where Fatima's uh, left us off after that um, that overview of everything that's been happening um, with transformation and the, the broader trends that, that we're seeing in the wider uh, asset management uh, environment, I would say that mostly mostly what uh, Fatima has said is also relevant in, in private markets, um, but perhaps I can draw a few distinctions. Um, uh, firstly, I would say, you know, the, the issue what, what uh, Fatima actually described as the, the controversial item, you know, which firms actually get included uh, as black fund managers. Um, I would like to just draw this distinction of, of what happens in, in private markets. And, and this is something that we've, we've, you know, we've thought about quite a lot uh, for the purposes of the survey and, and also for the purposes of our allocations, you know, within this space. Uh, what we apply as 27.4 is the uh, what's actually in the financial sector codes, uh, that there's a definition of what a black private equity firm is. Um, and why we, why we quite like that is that it's includes, uh, it includes various components and, and doesn't just look at uh, the scorecard of the, of the management firm. Um, uh, the criteria that are actually included within that, that definition is it, it does include uh, kind of the traditional aspects of, of ownership uh, but it also looks at some, you know, industry-specific things, uh, such as uh, the share of um, 
economics. So when there's uh, performance fees or carry that, that takes place uh, within, uh, within these uh, private markets funds, where does that go? Uh, does that, which, which individuals do, does that go to and does it actually benefit black people? Um, it also looks at the actual makeup of the, 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 the senior team. Um, is, the, is the private equity fund uh, actually being managed by black individuals? Um, and then lastly, it actually looks at the, the underlying components, what is being invested in. Uh, so it actually looks at the, the portfolio companies to see, you know, uh, is, there a, uh, is the threshold around uh, investment into companies that, are, uh, that have appropriate levels of black management and black ownership, rather, um, are those actually met? And if these if firms meet those criteria, then they then they're included in our um, in our survey. I think it's uh, it's it's impossible to talk about um, the evolution uh, and the you know the improvements that are happening with uh, black private markets fund managers without talking a little bit about kind of the uh, the overall changes that are happening within the private market space. Uh, this is still very much. Uh, uh, an evolution that's happening within uh, South Africa, uh, and there are still relatively small allocations from uh, the institutional investment market uh, to private markets uh, in general. Um, to quote the overall industry statistics, uh, the industry body, uh, SAPCA, um, uh, measures the, the total assets in the industry in an, in an annual survey that it does. Uh, the latest one came out about a month ago. Uh, they measured that uh, around 205 billion rands um, are within the, the, the private market space. Um, that still makes it a relatively small component um, of the, the greater institutional investment um, uh, environment, uh, particularly when you consider that probably half of that capital comes from uh, outside of South Africa. Um, we would say that you know that is something that's that's starting to shift and, and uh, um, more towards South Africa and certain components of the market, and that's something that I'll touch on uh, as we go through these these slides. So the the, the natural place to start with uh, with private markets is around fundraising. Uh, you know the fundraising um, uh, trajectory or the fundraising process with private markets funds tends to be different to the rest of the asset management industry. Uh, it's got a longer time frame to it. Um, it typically has more in-depth uh, due diligence the, that goes around it. Um, and part of the reasons for that is that you know the the, the investment vehicles that are used are typically uh, closed-end structures that are that only open at certain times. Um, so they only take investment at, at certain times, and um, uh, and and that does provide some um, you know constraints to to investors and means that. When a, when a retirement fund um, wants to invest, it can't always make uh, an investment at that point. So it has to kind of roll up its investment with, with other parties. So it has a little bit more um, complexity than, than typical fundraising uh, procedures. Um, that said, we are starting to see, uh, you know, the, the emergence of some maturity uh, within the space. It's still a relatively um, young uh, industry in general uh, within South Africa, but we are seeing you know, within the, the the black asset management space, we are seeing um, you know some uh, evolution that that's taking place. Firstly, in fund size, uh, so we see now that that the vast majority of fund managers who are raising capital are now raising um, are looking to raise uh, more than a billion rands. Um, this is this is quite a shift uh, over the last few years, um, and I think it's a it's it's an indication of of how the the economics um, continue to shift. Uh, in order for, yeah, you know, the fundraising is largely, the fundraising targets are largely driven by what the opportunity in the market is. So what, uh, what, what deals um, can be done by the particular fund manager? What kind of size deals are there to be done? Um, but the, the other side of that coin is around, you know, how do, we, uh, how do we set an appropriate team size and what is the, the cost of that team? And do the do the fees that can be earned on the asset base man match to the size of the um, of the funds that can be raised? And it's it's balancing balancing those dynamics that largely lead to the the establishment of uh, of a particular fund size or targeting of a particular fund size. You know, I think if we look back just a couple of years, the the, the kind of the the threshold for uh, a fund that could 
make sense and, and could actually break even um, was around the 500 million mark. And, uh, you know, over the years, uh, we've seen that push up uh, towards now uh, where, where, most, uh, where most investment managers are aiming at, uh, at the billion rand um, plus. Uh, a lot of fund managers can make the economics work um, somewhere between 500 million and a billion, uh, but it is something that has to be uh, where a lot of attention has to be paid uh, during the during the due diligence process and uh, kind of understanding the the position of each um, each fund manager. Um, so where are where are these different uh, black private markets fund managers in the market? Mostly, um, the the majority are either raising their first fund or managing their first fund. Um, but I would say that you know the this this chart is shifting. Um, when we look back just a couple of years, uh, this this was actually sitting much more predominantly in the raising of the first fund. Um, so there is some sort of shifting that's happening as the years go by into more fund managers actually managing and moving towards at least their second fund and some uh, going on to, to future funds. Uh, so the, the natural question is, well, where, where does the, the capital come from? And, um, you know, predominantly this is coming um, from, from local sources. Um, and more, more generally in the, the private markets environment, we're seeing uh, quite a, um, almost a, uh, an, an uncoupling or, or, or a divergence in, in where, where capital comes from for different types of, of strategies. So we've seen that within the, the areas of, um, for example, capital raising for renewable energy, we've continued to see a lot of capital come for renewable energy from, from offshore sources. Um, the that's the one area where where European um, uh, development finance institutions continue to fund. Um, whereas when we when we look at the uh, the black asset managers uh, within the private market space who are typically fundraising for um, for domestic uh, private equity strategies, uh, that fundraising is almost exclusively coming from local sources. And predominantly from South African pension funds, you know. So when we say South African pension funds, you know, that may be it may be that it comes through uh, fund of funds who also predominantly get their funding from South African pension funds, um, or through uh, uh, asset consultants on behalf of their their pension funds clients. Um, uh, and then the last category, the last kind of components of that is also life companies. Um, who tend to be also investing a lot of uh, retirement savings um, on behalf of, of, of their, uh, their clients. So when you kind of put these components together, you know, the vast majority of the capital that's coming to support uh, black private markets funds uh, is coming through, is coming from, uh, from retirement funds. So it's important to see, you know, what is the, the sentiment within these groups? What is the, the, the shift? And so we asked our, our respondents, um, about this, and we said, if you consider, you know, the engagements that you're having with these different types of uh, investors now uh, versus the, um, you know, engagements that you had, uh, say, two years ago, you know, how does that compare? And we, interestingly, we found that um, that our respondents said that that across all categories, they're seeing more positive engagements now than they were two years ago. Um, so that talks to the the fact that there there is more interest in private markets in general, you know, following the, the, the global trends, uh, more shifting towards um, private markets. Um, but also that's, you know, there's that, there's the, there's a trend of, of wanting to invest locally, um, particularly from the, that uh, South African pension fund cohort. So we're seeing much more positive engagements coming um, across those different uh, categories that are representing the, the local um, retirement savings um, fund group. We're also seeing the, the importance of, of black manager programs and more than 40% of funds being raised uh, coming through uh, programs that are designed specifically to support uh, black fund managers. Um, so that, that's an extremely important route for, for capital being raised uh, in, this, uh, in this area of the market. Uh, interestingly, we're seeing extremely little funding coming from development finance institutions um, I think the number is around uh, less than five percent uh, that actually comes uh, from uh, from from these development finance institutions. 
um, more broadly. Um, we we see this as something that's that's quite um, that's quite strange, given that the, the the private markets channel and particularly private equity has been used extensively by global uh, development finance institutions as a tool for development, um, particularly for things like job creation and other types of impact um, over the last number of decades. It's something that's been done and continues to be done by most. Uh, uh, of the European development finance institutions, but also you know North American, um, the North American counterparts. Uh, so it's 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 um, strange in a way that this is not being adopted by local development finance institutions. It's not seen as a uh, as the channel uh, a channel to use. Um, just to kind of quote, just to, to to make a point around the the allocations and uh, the kind of the impacts that that, that allocations within the space can have. Um, we estimate that you know somewhere between one and two percent of retirement fund savings are invested within private markets, and we know that the uh, there's a there's there's the changes um, that are being drafted to Regulation Twenty Eight that would put uh, the limit up from um, currently ten percent, which is well above the one to two percent that's actually being used, but up from ten percent up to fifteen percent. Uh, just for the private equity component. So this is not private private markets as a whole. It doesn't include private debt or you know other other components. But just with the private equity components, the limit is the draft limit, which we expect to come through in the finalization of the Regulation 28 document. Um, so that's being pushed up to to 15 percent, showing that there's a lot of regulatory uh, comfort with this uh, as an asset class. But if the you know if if the 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 retirement fund community um, actually adopted that change and pushed up its allocations to somewhere close to that limit. It would be the biggest stimulus package I think this ever this country has ever seen. It would it could push up to around a trillion rands um, into uh, in, into the space, um, and certainly more than than five hundred billion. So it, it would be an enormous shift, an enormous um, uh, injection of. Uh, of um, of stimulus into the local economy, which could be achieved uh, simply by by shifts in, in allocations. So I think it's something for for all of us to think about in in our different allocation uh, conversations. Uh, something we always ask our, our participants in the survey is, you know, the extent to which the the, the playing field is actually being leveled out. Um, so we ask a number of questions around this area, and um, and the, the answers are always always interesting to see how things are evolving. Um, so there was a there was a clear feeling um, this year that the regulations that are in place uh, around uh, black private markets um, entrance into this market and, and around building skills are not actually sufficient, uh, and that more um, more could be done in that area to support uh, these kind of managers. Um, but interestingly. Managers uh, that are operating in the space did actually feel like they could uh, compete against the incumbents, with 68% uh, saying that they believe that they can compete fairly against um, uh, against the the incumbent um, GPs or the incumbent uh, fund managers within the space. Um, the overwhelming majority saw a need for formal incubation of new fund managers. 80% uh, said yes, there should be uh, formal incubation of of new fund managers. That's and that's uh, you know consistent with prior years and the vast majority saying yes. Um, when asked what um, whether uh, investors had actually played an active incubation role in in the fund of the particular respondents, around a quarter said yes, um, and which is broadly in line. There's been a little bit of uh, flexibility in that over the years, but but around that kind of proportion, say that. Uh, that that some um, incubation role has been played by at least one of the investors, and some of the uh, some of the the respondents said that multiple uh, investors had played that kind of role, um, but the majority said that none of their investors had played that type of incubation role. Um, you know, in compare in 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 contrast to the slide where we asked, is there a need? So there's there's clearly a mismatch between the um, the demand for incubation uh, type of uh, role and what's actually being received in the markets. On to challenges. The, the challenges uh, don't change much from, from year to year. Um, fundraising is always the, the biggest challenge um, for our participants. Um, 
And uh, I think the, the related challenges of, uh, you know, having working capital for their investment management businesses while they're fundraising is, is, is related to the, the fundraising item. Um, and also related is the, the item of uh, creating a, a track record de- or demonstrating a track record, you know, while the wh- while fundraising without uh, without assets. And I think this is a this is a key difference in the private market space to the uh, to the listed um, markets. In the listed markets, it's easier for a um, an emerging manager to start uh, start investing capital with a smaller pool of capital or, or, a, or a small allocation that they can demonstrate their, their strategy um, with, uh, with some seed assets more easily. Whereas in the private market space, the, the kind of the threshold, the minimum threshold of assets to viably execute on a strategy is significantly higher. And so it, it, um, it creates a, a, a lag in, in fundraising and, and creates these kind of issues that, that are being flagged as the biggest challenges um, for these fund managers. Um, when it comes to external risks, the, the macro environment is something that, uh, that that's, you know, is, some, is flagged as a concern. Um, so the fact that there's low growth, there's political risk and policy uncertainty, um, those are all the, the biggest external risks to their businesses that, uh, that black fund managers see. Uh, in this space, um, as you can imagine, the the more uh, encouraging the and more business friendly the um, the environment is domestically, uh, the more opportunity there is for for fund managers to produce the kind of returns that investors want to see, um, and that ultimately is something that um, that uh, private markets managers would see as uh, as positive for their businesses if those kind of uh, those those big macro areas could be addressed. That would be uh, a massive um, uh, improvement in the space. So Fatima mentioned that um, uh, you know impact and ESG investing is a large theme um, broadly across all asset classes. This is definitely something that's a, a huge part of the private market space. In fact, it's very rare that we see. Um, you know, we're taking pitches from uh, from fund managers all the time, and it's extremely rare these days that you see a pitch that doesn't have an impact component. Um, so mostly, what we see is 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 fund managers have actually mapped their their strategy, um, say to the sustainable development goals, and they've seen what what kind of um, you know outcomes they can get alongside their strategy. Uh, you know, they typically look at the various frameworks that are out there to see. You know what? What? Um, you know when they're applying their strategy in the market, they all acknowledge that there will be you know an impact, a broader impact, uh, and mostly fund managers do go and, and actually follow that through and say this is these are the areas where we think the specific impact will be. You know whether it's on um, climate related issues or whether it's on jobs um, or transformation issues. Um, it's yeah. It's you'll see here in the actually only one of our twenty respondents in this place in this uh, survey uh, said that they, they don't consider impact at all uh, in the way that they put their their marketing together. And I expect that when we get to next year's survey, that will probably be zero. Um, it's something that every fund manager um, must be considering, um, and it's something that's certainly on the minds of the you know when we speak to our uh, pension fund clients, it's certainly on the mind of the trustees. And you know, in for example, in the the, the training that we do uh, that we do from time to time with our, our, our retirement fund clients, um, it, the private markets conversation often goes alongside the impact conversation uh, because it's seen as a very um, sort of direct way to to access impact um, in the local economy. So we also asked uh, what uh, at, at um, you know at the at the impact level, um, what kind of changes have have private markets funds seen in employment within their investee companies and within transformation? Um, you know, it was very clear that uh, that that most of the respondents saw very positive changes in both of these areas. Uh, you know, some said they don't they don't keep the necessary records, but I think that's something that's also we're going to see it. It's uh, weeding itself out of the, the survey over time as, as all investment managers see the, the relevance and the necessity to keep these, these kind of records. Um, 60% of our respondents said that they saw a significant positive change in employment in their portfolio companies. 
uh, and 65% said a significant positive change in the BE ratings. Now, those are both things that are very objectively easy to measure, and uh, that's why we, we asked them in, in this particular survey. You know, other, other impact items, um, you know, such as access to services and water and impact on energy, they become a slightly more nuanced to measure. So we ask these very, um, very objective measures to see, you know, what, um, where, where, where are the fund managers actually performing in terms of, of these, uh, these very clear metrics. When it comes to the formalization of impact in private markets funds, this is something that is, uh, you know, is has shifted very quickly. Um, although it did shift, although it did start from a relatively high base, uh, there's been, um, you know, long before there was uh, such an impact, such an uh, uh, a focus on ESG within the the listed markets. The private market space has had a much bigger um, focus on um, impact and, and ESG measures for a very long period of time. As long as I've been involved in this industry, there's been um, all of the you know the, the funds that have investment from development finance institutions from offshore. They've always had ESG reporting. They've always had to do ESG due diligence on the investments that they make. So there was a relatively high base, um, but we've seen that you know even even increase from that relatively high base. In the investments that we make as, as 27.4 within the space, I mean, that's something, this is something that we contract for. I mean, we contract for access to, to job evidence and transformation evidence uh, as a matter of course. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's increasingly seen as normal um, within the space. So, you know, when we're talking about the, the impact of, of job creation and particularly job creation and transformation uh, within the, you know, private markets investments into the local economy, uh, this is not something that um, you know is fudged or or anything like that. We this is something that actually gets evidenced with ID numbers, um, uh, you know, actual evidence of, of transformation scorecards, etc. So it's something that that is extremely tightly um, controlled and something that's contracted for as part of the investment process. Just lastly, moving on to the the makeup of um, teams within the space. You know the the median team composition was around nine individuals, um, so that was around four people in the investment team and then uh, five support staff. You know this is more for for teams that are up and running. What we the way that these teams tend to evolve is that is typically two or three founders uh, that that start out that that use their their personal savings you know from their time within. Say an investment bank, and you know the skills that they've gained within either another private equity firm or within um, you know banking environments. Uh, they use the the savings that they've created that they've that they've put together over a period of time um, to break out and start their own firm. And then from there, they they extend the team as they raise capital. Um, they go and hire say an associate, and then they hire support staff along the way. But they typically start out with a with a smaller team, and as things grow. They, uh, they, they are able to, to hire more um, support staff. Fatima talked a lot about the, uh, the diversity and inclusion within the broader asset management space. Uh, when we looked at this within the, um, within the private market space, it's perhaps uh, slightly more pleasing on this side. Um, in total staff, you know, we do see quite a good balance. Um, and in fact, there are, in, in terms of total staff within these, uh, within within black investment managers, we actually see the majority being female. Um, that's skews slightly the other way when we look at only investment staff, uh, where there's that 57 43 um, split towards male staff. Um, and uh, perhaps the the one area where more attention could be paid is for particularly for um, the inclusion uh, gender inclusion is around when we look at the senior positions. So when we look at the the CEO, um, CIO roles, um, you know, there's there's definitely a skew towards um, towards males, um, but similarly to in the listed markets, when we look at the positions of of CFO and to a lesser extent, um, you know, head of investor relations, uh, we see more um, slightly more women being included uh, in the in those roles. Um, so that's something that that's interesting. You know, I think that. Um, uh, what we do see is that 
males tend to be uh, more often tend to be founders um, of these teams, um, and that's where kind of this 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 slant or the skew um, comes from. Um, we're increasingly, we are seeing more women founders coming into the space, um, and we we hope that you know I, I think as we see kind of more uh, examples of women who've been successful in the space, hopefully we will see uh, more women founders starting private markets firms and um, you know gaining traction within the markets. Uh, the last couple of slides here are just around the, the economics of these teams, um, just to give an indication for, for anyone looking at the space and, and what's what's normal, or for, for investment managers who are um, you know, deciding how to set these different levels. Um, far and away, so that for those not familiar with what a GP commitment is, this is the, the, the level of capital that the fund manager actually puts into their, their own funds. Um, so typically for, for black um, private markets firms, they're putting in 1% of the total capital of the fund. Um, so, you know, if it's a billion rand fund, they're putting in 10 million rand of their, their own capital alongside investors. Um, investors do expect that to, to increase uh, as the, the, the evolution of the, the team um, um, goes from fund one to fund two and, and later funds. Uh, there's and there's there's definitely an emphasis on seeing that the the team continues to put a significant share of their own capital, um, you know, their own balance sheets into the fund to make sure that they are uh, they are aligned to investors in that respect. Uh, I mentioned that uh, you know the the founders of of these teams uh, tend to. Uh, they tend to come out of an other private equity firms or out of the banking environment where they've they've managed to generate capital of their own and they use that to to found um, they use that to to found their firms and so when we look at where the, the GP commitment or so that that allocation of the the managers own capital into their funds comes from um, it's mostly coming from the the management company uh, itself so and that's typically their own capital coming through the management company. Um, or uh, sometimes from outside investors in the management company, um, and then from the principals themselves directly uh, into the funds. Um, there's relatively little capital that comes from uh, the uh, associates or the analysts within the team. But what is interesting to see is that the share of carry or the share of the performance fees, so the, the outcome, um, is, of course, largely skewed to, to the people who commit the, the capital, who put up the, the cash to, to actually make sure that the, um, the GP commit is there. But uh, it is good to see that there's an outsized split towards the associates who, who often are the, the kind of the engine room of the, of, of the teams and, and carry quite a heavy load. Um, although they might not have capital of their own to put up, they tend to get an outsized share of the, um, of, of the, the performance fees that come um, compared to how much capital they put in as part of their uh, their own GP commit share. Um, yeah, so uh, I mentioned before that mostly the capital comes from a personal savings. Um, the one evolution I would say is that over the last few years, as we've seen um, more working capital facilities come available uh, to, uh, to fund managers. Um, and we've seen a number of fund managers within the space and, and some of our own fund managers actually take this up. And, and there are more than one institution now that are actually offering those, those kinds of facilities. Um, but still, far and away, the majority of capital actually comes from um, the founders themselves. Um, the very last slide I have is just around management fees. Uh, Fatima mentioned in the overall findings that we're seeing the, the overall trend of fee compression happening. Um, private equity is not immune to this, although it's um, although it's, it's been affected to a lesser degree. We still see around half of the, the respondents saying that their uh, their management fees are two percent of, of committed capital, um, and almost half saying that it's below that. And in the odd case, uh, you, you have uh, an arrangement that's that's higher than that. Um, but we are seeing more emphasis on more. Um, uh, more variable structures, more innovative structures coming through as uh, as as institutions look for ways that make sense to them to invest in the space um, that don't kind of skew their overall fee ratios too much. 
so that's all I've got. I'll, I'll hand back uh, back to the team. Um, yeah, we, we we're very pleased to see a lot of the, uh, the 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 numbers coming through from the respondents. We've seen a significant up, uptick in the the capital in the space, um, and we hope to continue to see the the broadening of the the private markets um, component of institutional savings in this country grow. Um, and as part of that, the the growth of the the, the emerging managers and, and black fund managers come through um, in the space as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory, for an amazing presentation and, and, and the insightful way in which you double all that content. We have run out of time, so I am going to ask for just your closing remarks, especially for those who have to drop off at 12 o'clock. We will, however, stay online for another 15 minutes. I think we have a number of really interesting questions. I've got Fatima with me. So it is, you know, I, I don't want to lose the opportunity to ask some of these questions directly. But Rory, if you could close off for me, um, especially when you come, there's one particular question that, I, that, that is asked one around are we going to see more credible balanced or at least full service asset managers coming up what are your thoughts on that and any other closing remarks uh, thanks Anila. look i think what um what we what we are will see over the coming years is greater maturity within the space um, uh, we expect to see some more, um, some consolidation within the space, and, and we, well, what we're really hoping to see actually is more collaboration um, between different asset managers and sharing costs, um, uh, creating a lower cost but full, fuller service uh, private markets type of offerings uh, into the space. We think those kinds of those kind of shifts within the market uh, will make sense and will keep private markets relevant and keep private markets investable. Uh, for for local institutions, the, the more the more we see the movement in that direction, uh, the more we can see the private markets becoming uh, more relevant and creating a greater share of the local institutional capital. Thank you so much. The world is changing and it's great to see some agility and, and out-of-the-box thinking um, in, in the private market. But thank you so much. Uh, we will answer all your questions on Twitter, on all the social feeds, if you if you post them there as well. We have to say goodbye to some of you, those who can stay. Thank you so much. Remember, all this information is available on our website. The stats, the report, as well as the recording can be accessed, so please go to our website. We will also post it on all our, our social media feeds. Thank you for joining us. It's been fantastic. Um, I do have with me uh, Fatima. Fatima, it's been an incredible morning. Thank you so much. I think there are so many questions for us to look at. And I think you, you really have explained a number of things. We are going to touch on diversity and inclusion, um, as well as the ability to participate equitably in the industry. But we also need to talk about the talent and whether or not we see ourselves continuing to build and see a growth in the pipeline that goes into the markets of diverse candidates. Yes, um, thanks, Anile. It's been a fantastic morning, and thank you. Uh, so there's been a couple of questions on the feed, and people have asked, uh, you know, will Cape Town continue to be the centre of asset management? Uh, is that going to change now with the digital transformation? Uh, what about people, uh, you know, predominantly being counting and Cape Town based historically. And we are beginning to see shifts in those trends. With the digital revolution, it means that we have access to global human capital. I mean, unfortunately, South Africa does have a massive of uh, um, skills shortage and we've also got an unemployment shortage so we've got to balance those two challenges but what uh, the digital transformation does allow is it allows us to access capital from human capital and skills and talent from anywhere in the world uh, because that, that that's just nobody's too far away. Uh, and I think that will mean that we begin to see shifts. We do have um, skills deficiency in South Africa, uh, particularly in the financial services sector. Uh, and I think uh, a lot more work needs to be done in collaborating with our tertiary institutions in terms of how we close that gap. Um, and also the programs that are run by government and private sector institutions. I think uh, we need, those need revisiting uh, because we're not growing uh, the type of talent and the level of skills that we should be growing. And we're not adapting fast enough. So the conversation even with the institutions and the universities is to enable them to create the kind of curriculum and attract the right kind of students and enable even those 
probably have a longer route to, to getting in. Uh, but let's move back to the digitalization question. Um, what is the, the capital requirement and are, is the black, um, is, are the black asset managers able to do the digitalization and take full advantage of it or is this going to be also another stumbling block for them? I think absolutely, you know, I don't think it's a stumbling block. I think, um, you know, as I said earlier, uh, you know, uh, black owned asset management firms uh, need to extend uh, their penetration outside of just the institutional investor. They can, in fact, uh, get UK investors or US investors or the whole world is open now with digitization. Um, and just doing simple things uh, like uh, being able to transact online as opposed to uh, going through an intermediary process. So if you want to increase distribution and increase penetration, uh, you know, it doesn't cost a lot for your clients to come onto your website or through an app and buy units in your unit trust product. And that's how you create distribution. Because as I said earlier, consumers want the same experience they get on Amazon. Yeah. They want that in their entire life, you know, in, in everything that they do. They want people to come to them. They want that quick, 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 tick, 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 press, press, press experience. And why shouldn't you, your, 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 online facility allow the customer to come and buy units in your unit trust portfolio. Mm -hmm. So those are simple changes you can make to improve distribution and provide access to consumers. Simple simple changes you can make, but it requires a real mindset. We all have to really be digitally savvy, digitally wise, and not afraid of it, and take full advantage as we are seeing a consumer who does want to do everything on their mobile device, and they have the standards are across. So what they experience on Amazon, they want to experience on any other platform. But it's a, it's a huge challenge, and it's a beautiful challenge, and, and we will see who does it well, because it will mean those with staying power even beyond the pandemic. Yeah, but, yeah so, so that's why earlier on, I, um, you know, I discussed, the different asset management models that exist in the market. So uh, if you want to be a large distribution powerhouse, then you gear your business and design your business to leverage that type of potential. But if you want to be um, you know, a high-touch, uh, very niche solutions provider where you add a value on uh, providing customized and tailored solutions uh, that requires very top-level skills, then that's your business and your niche and, and you become well-known for it. So craft where you believe you want to play and structure everything around you to achieve that outcome. But one of the main reasons we are here today is to talk about the triple BE legislation. Um, do we feel that it is something so relevant? And you mentioned it slightly. Um, should we throw it away and pack for me the spirit that's required? If we're not complying, what is the spirit that's required? Not just to get the black person on the seat, but the spirit that's required to really believe that the investing in diversity and inclusion is good for society, it's also good for your bottom line. I think we miss the spirit and we miss people making the effort to learn about what does it mean to create equity and inclusion? Uh, yes, no, absolutely. So I think uh, uh, the code is, is everyone is complying, but everyone is getting very, very good results. So everyone is a level one uh, service provider in the market now, and it's become too easy to achieve a level one through input spend. So we need to focus on outputs and achieving good outcomes. As I said earlier, the focus is on the easy components of the scorecard that can easily be bought, but we need to focus on skills development. We need to focus on management control, uh, and we need to focus on the real areas that will provide and grow a stronger South Africa. Uh, and that's really where some of these issues that you've highlighted uh, needs to be addressed. And I think our focus has been too much on uh, tick boxing and not enough on achieving good socioeconomic outcomes. This is a question interesting on the same one. Why are asset managers not more active driving transformation in listed entities? Very good question. Very good question. And I think, uh, you know, that's why um, the prominence and the priority of ESG is so important, environmental, social and governance, because we don't only deal with climate issues. We don't only deal with, with, uh, 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 with um, equality. Uh, we deal with these type of issues and they need to be addressed at 
Uh, company AGMs, company boards need to be challenged. Company management needs to be challenged in the same way as I spoke about earlier, where asset managers are challenging um, a Cecil with regards to climate change issues. Uh, we should challenge the boards of companies on diversity, inclusion and transformation issues. Thanks so much, Fatima. Is Rory still with us? Because there's a question that I'd love for him to answer. Rory, there's a question on um, are black private equity fund managers looking at existing businesses within the township economy, your shabins, your tuck shops, but over and above that, I, I'm, I, the, the, there's a focus on innovative tech-based businesses that are also run by black individuals and, and many other quite um, interesting black township-based uh, businesses. Your thoughts on that question, Rory? Yeah, so one of the questions that we asked in the survey was around uh, different strategies that are used uh, by, by black private markets fund managers. Uh, the predominant strategy is in the mid-market. Um, most fund managers said that that's where they're, they're operating, um, which means these are fairly well-established businesses. They're often um, family-owned businesses that are transitioning from being family-owned into being more, more corporatized. Uh, that's an it's a it's an off, uh, oftentimes that's the transition that um, that the private equity firm helps them to make. Uh, there are a number of firms uh, within uh, the South African uh, private market space that do focus on smaller businesses. Um, although it is a, a niche, a more niche area as part of the the broader spectrum here, um, uh, it's a specialist area as you might as, uh, as you might imagine working. Um, with smaller uh, investee companies and those investee companies that are less formalized is higher touch. Um, so it takes a lot from the, the, the fund managers and they must be set up in a way that can, um, that can cater for that and that can work with those much, much smaller enterprises. Um, so there are a handful of those, those types of funds um, that are investing in those businesses, uh, but predominantly it's the mid-market. And then um, increasingly, some more focus on uh, infrastructure related items as well, such as uh, water projects, um, renewable energy projects, um, et cetera, those, those sorts of things. Thank you so much, Rory. Um, a great answer. I hope that you're happy with that. I think we have somebody that wants to actually ask a question, Al Marie. Um, we'll have a little, okay, I'll come back to, to that question. Um, Fatima, we had a question that we talked about earlier on, and it was a question that was asked about the survey itself. If you had to put sound them in uh, sunlight and prescient, how would that impact the analysis? So um, there was a slide that I put up earlier on, which showed that outside of uh, the top uh, five asset management firms, which is uh, Sunlam, Prescient, Tequanta, uh, Alwani, and Bunani, um, the balance of the 50 asset managers manage uh, around 5% of the overall AUM. So uh, those top, uh, the top three asset managers uh, manage around 60%, uh, and the top five asset managers uh, manage around 70%. So there's a long tail of, of managers outside of the biggest asset managers that are less sustainable and are managing much less AUM. All right. Yeah. Going back to the diversity question, one of our questions as well was around um, what do you think are some of the barriers that are unwritten or unseen barriers to the transformation when it comes to the conversations being had, all the boards, all the executives? You know, it's easy enough. We look at the numbers, but are we able to put name to reasons why? Yes, I think there's a couple of challenges. Uh, I think the one challenge that I spoke about earlier as well is that uh, transition from analyst to portfolio manager, uh, some of the other issues in relation to uh, expanding what uh, diversity, equity and inclusion actually mean uh, uh, about work culture, uh, about um, executive strategy. Uh, and at the end of the day, it comes back to, as I said earlier, you know, being invited to the party, not allowed to dance is not a strategy that is sustainable. Thank you so much. Any final thoughts from you? It's been a fantastic uh, No, I hope, you know, we haven't been able to, um, we've spoken a lot, we've taken a lot of uh, our listeners' time, etc. 
Uh, but for more detail and more in-depth uh, findings, I think the actual publication will answer a lot of your questions. Uh, and people are welcome to reach out to us, whether it's directly through email or social media, and we'll be happy to make the time to discuss some of the questions one-on-one -on -one with anyone that is interested. Thank you, Zanelli. Thank you so much. Thank you for your effort, and thank you so much for um, the commitment to this journey. I think it's time for us to close. Um, are we at a good place? Radesh Maharaj, he's on the line, a professional principal executive officer and serves as an independent trustee and a principal officer of retirement funds with a great deep background and understanding um, when he's as he's played several roles in the retirement funds industry for also almost over two decades. If you could close for us, please, much appreciated. Thank you, Zanele, and uh, uh, thanks everyone for attending this uh, session. Uh, as uh, chairperson of the Council of Retirement Funds of South Africa, BATSITA, uh, we're proud to be uh, working with and associated uh, with 27.4 on this 13th annual BE Economic Survey of the State of the uh, Transformation in South African Asset Management Space. Uh, it's such an important uh, aspect, again, uh, what is vital for, for us uh, sitting as uh, trustees, principal officers, et cetera, in uh, retirement funds is that uh, we need to uh, not rely so much on uh, anecdotal evidence anymore and uh, look at uh, proper empirical measurement. Uh, and as uh, Fatima said earlier on, uh, how do we use what's measured in forecasting in, uh, in our funds? How do we use uh, that information in making allocation uh, decisions, etc. And uh, that's why this uh, 13th survey is, is, is so vital in that conversation for, for, for every retirement fund in our country. And that's why uh, BATSITA is so proud to be associated uh, with uh, such an event as well. Just uh, uh, again, uh, picking up on a few uh, items that were already discussed, uh, so, for example, 79% of assets, as Fatima noted, uh, uh, invested with uh, black asset managers uh, come from institutional investors. And, of course, uh, as Rory noted, retirement funds uh, are the vast majority of that. Uh, and as asset owners, we, we as retirement funds play such an important role in allocating our monies and, in this case, allocating monies to uh, uh, black asset managers. Again, uh, it's it's uh, really heartening to see from the stats presented uh, this morning uh, that there are increased allocations to black uh, managers uh, from retirement funds as well. Uh, so uh, this uh, significant increase uh, is something that we need to take note of and to be proud of. But what I think is also uh, eminently clear is that uh, this uh, sort of change in trend must continue. Uh, and again, it is up to uh, retirement funds as asset owners to continue that, uh, that trend. Uh, second point I wanted to pick up on uh, with regards to uh, pension funds uh, getting more involved in private markets. What's clear, and uh, this came uh, through in, uh, in Rory's presentation, was that uh, even at present, uh, uh, pension fund investment in uh, the private market space uh, is, is still relatively small overall. Uh, but with the uh, current uh, emphasis on infrastructure investing in this country uh, uh, and uh, general development, uh, there's no doubt that retirement funds will have to uh, look at uh, the space uh, more carefully and start investing more in the private market space. So for uh, I think for the uh, medium to long term, that's de definitely going to be uh, an emphasis for ourselves as retirement funds in South Africa. Again, uh, I think the conversation about uh, uh, returns and um, uh, uh, investment uh, in infra, etc., is already answered. It needs to be done. Uh, if retirement fund members can't uh, retire 
in a society uh, that uh, is reasonable to live in, uh, it, it, it brings down the whole objective of uh, retirement fund savings. Or, uh, so please, uh, again, as trustees, those of you listening, uh, you need to uh, take heed of, of that. Similarly, I think uh, with the survey, uh, our headline this year was uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, as South Africans, we've, we've lived through uh, seriously tough times in the last 18 months, especially. Uh, and these things need to be taken seriously and uh, attention needs to be paid and we need to put our money where our mouths are in respect of these aspects. Uh, especially with regards to, uh, as is evident again from uh, from this year's survey, uh, the need for inclusivity, etc., uh, throughout the structures of our uh, asset managers. What we don't want to do and what we should never do going forward is uh, try to uh, dress things up uh, for uh, just in order to gain uh, assets for for your company. That's not how it should work. Uh, it goes against uh, the entire outcomes-based uh, uh, model that we're looking at in our financial services sector. So again, uh, it's again moving away from this anecdotal types of evidence that we, we had to this measured uh, type of information that uh, is uh, uh, readily available now uh, uh, through through these survey findings, and 274 has been doing it for 13 years. So uh, again, as was discussed earlier, there's trends, etc., that can now uh, be seen and uh, be used by those who are interested in in you uh, in this sort of thing. So without uh, saying anything further, what I want to say is uh, thank you, uh, 274, for. Uh, for doing this for all of us. I think it's uh, it's something so vital for, for our country. And thank you, everyone, for attending and uh, participating today uh, uh, as well. Do please go uh, to the website and uh, download this 13th uh, BE Economic Survey so that you can uh, also see uh, all the results from the survey. I'm, I'm going to stop and hand over uh, to Zanele. Thank you, everyone.